us, I would consider us an SDN enabler. So we can actually, um, so this talk's not gonna be pitching Cumulus Linux so much as just showing where I'm coming from. Because um, this kind of stuff I'm showing today will work with Arista or Cisco or our competitors. But I think it just shows where I'm coming from, um, just so we know. So I have one slide on what Cumulus is, and this is what I chose. Um, we run on bare metal switches, so the same way you install Red Hat or Ubuntu to bare metal servers, you install Cumulus Linux to bare metal switches, and you get your choice of OS. On top of this, in the market segment we're competing in, this is the exact same hardware that our competitors are running. They're just charging 50 to 100% or more than what the actual cost of it is. A lot of times this is stamped in the same factories, it's made in the same places, um, and this disaggregation is like one huge pillar of what we find as a company is this hardware disaggregation. And then since we're Linux, like you literally jump on our product, it's automatable, it's just Debian-based Linux. I do IP link show, I have config, all the commands you're used to. It just looks like a server with a bunch of NICs on it. Um, so I came to Cumulus before I think the website was working because I just wanted to do Linux and networking. I just found this funny company with like 20 people working at it and eventually kept harassing them until they hired me um, to do stuff like this, um, which was SDN. So the actual VP of engineering asked me, what do you think of SDN? And I was like, I think it's a buzzword and I hate it. So um, <laughs> then I think that was the interview. I think Shraji basically was like, I like this guy because he hates the word SDN too. Because um, SDN means a lot of stuff to different people. Um, it's a very confusing term and I, and that's kind of what this talk will go into is kind of real briefly what I think SDN is and then kind of talking about DevOps tools and using them in an SDN environment. So one thing is a lot of people equate SDN to OpenFlow and it's very easy, like openflow.org um, will tell you that it's an experimental protocol, it never mentions SDN. It's one of many things that consider themselves SDN and I think a more generic description of this is an abstraction of higher level functionality. So SDN to me just means programmable networks. And like, what, is, what does that really mean? Because that just sounds like a lot of buzzwords again, like watching HBO Silicon Valley. Um, so I kind of break, this is a slide I use in partner training a lot. Um, so SDN, we kind of break it out into open flow solutions. So Cumulus Linux and Cumulus Networks, we don't really believe in open flow for a variety of reasons. That doesn't mean it's not a good technology it doesn't mean that it won't be successful um, at all. Um, it's just something that we don't do. So hopefully you didn't come to this talk, hopefully to learn about OpenFlow. <laughs> um, there's vendor specific solutions. Um, some of those are hidden to what they're actually doing under the, the hood. Um, I know ACI and, and Contrails do use some VXLAN stuff. Um, what we are pitching at Cumulus Networks is called something called network virtualization, which is kind of synonymous with SDN. And this is something uh, around br bringing up and down VXLAN tunnels, so VMware NSX. I think the most interesting story to think about is Nicera, which was the startup company that became VMware NSX. They actually invented OpenFlow. And they chose that it wasn't a scalable solution, so they went into network virtualization. So now they can build tunnels over an IP fabric. Um, and then they made a viable product and they got bought out and all those guys are probably rich now from what I <laughs> what I've seen. Um, so what's cool about our product is we're just an OS. Cumulus, like we don't sell hardware, we don't sell these, these overlays, um, we're just a Linux distribution just like Red Hat. So um, makes it easy is we can use all these players. We see that VMware NSX, Medicure as MidoNet, Open Control Project, Nuage, Plum Grid, they can all run on our, on our hardware. Um, they can also run on our competitors' hardware too a lot of times but it keeps you from getting vendor lock-in or being stuck with a single vendor. So I wanna take this theory one step further, and that's what this talks about, is if you abstract away the network into controllers, because it seems like network virtualization is really cool with these, these VXLAN overlays, is why not just take off-the-shelf DevOps tools that are available that most people in this room have played with before and use them to make automatable changes to, to, to what's going on? Um, so using something like Ansible, Puppet, Chef, Salt, um, I think the sky's the limit. Since, since a lot of these tools will work on Arista or Cisco, but since we're a Linux OS, they just work. It just works very easily. So we can kind of think of these scenarios, right? Rapid provisioning, 
Um, that one's pretty easy, just like servers. You use it for provisioning and bringing up the network. Hot swapping the switch, now you're getting a little bit more interesting, is now that we sell commodity switches that are really inexpensive, um, you can break up these large chassis that are super expensive because now that the network's very robust and these spine leaf networks, I can just pull out a spine switch, put in a new one, and provision one on demand. So now we're actually having customers at our company that have hot spares. The stuff's so inexpensive that they actually buy 10 extra ones, and we only charge for the licenses for the ones in active production so that they can actually just hot swap on demand and troubleshoot it offline. They don't have to troubleshoot on their live network. Um, Configuration management just makes sense. I think oh, we get asked a lot in, in sales kind of calls where, what's your config management plan? And for us, since it's Linux, we can just use Git. Like you can literally have a Git tree on the box. Um, I, think, I think Git's actually installed by default on our box. Um, so you can just Git clone the code and your configuration management's either managed by Ansible Puppet or literally you can just have all your files in a Git repo for what you care. So obviously, easy application deployment, the same thing. Like we can install apps, Ganglia, um, Collect the Puppet Agent, right? The same way as, as anyone can. Um, maintenance tasks, nothing's interesting here, right? Um, user administration, you can do the same things you're doing on servers, on switches, and you should be able to. But what if I told you you could do so much more? So this is saying, I don't think we bring it back to what SDN means, and to me SDN means is like smart programmatic changes to the network based on criteria that you choose. So to me, being a QA engineer in the past, and getting like really loving automation, anything I do more than twice, I should be automating. And the network's no um, exception to that. If people in the network team aren't doing it, they're just creating work for themselves. I don't wanna get up at midnight to go add a VLAN or restart a box, it just sounds silly. Um, and especially when you have so many switches you should have enough failover that you can look at it in the morning. So let's look at some of these kind of scenarios that are outside the normal DevOps type environment for just provisioning and bringing stuff up and down. Because what is different about a network switch than a server is it's more important because if it goes down, it brings down the whole rack. So you have to be really smart about how these changes do. So reactive network changes, and this is what I think I'm gonna do my, or I am doing my demo on. So bad fan, high temperature, um, when something happens to that switch, you can predictably know when it fails, looking at logs, and then make a change to that box. So we could prepend BGPAS, we could increase OSPF costs, um, we can take links down manually with scripts using Ansible or Salt, just pushing, or Puppets M Collective, or Chef Knife, right? It's very easy to make decisions based on, on logging events. Um, Hit list upgrades, so I wanna upgrade my racks. A lot of times I have dual redundancy, um, so I can have it prefer a route one direction and then bring that box down, upgrade it, and then switch sides. This is like six lines of Ansible code to do something like that. It's very, very simple. Um, and you can do that, I mean, you could do this probably with a Cisco box today if you don't wanna do Cumulus, like just using these off the shelf tools to kind of create a programmatic network. Um, automatic threat response. So a lot of times your network goes down and it's like two days later that you figured out what happened. Um, it's not a very smart way to troubleshoot. So you can watch counters, you can use the monitoring tools out there, and then you can have like a, a short term kind of, of way to respond. So you can kind of dive into each of these. And these are just, these are just three that I came up with in the last few months. Um, I'm sure the sky's the limit. Um, we're kind of calling this net DevOps, I think Andreas was using, um, our, our business guy, um, to, to target this. So the idea is kind of DevOps for network engineers or network, so outside of just the, the, the servers. Um, so this creates the actual network to be self-healing. Um, at this point, since a lot of these, these commodity boxes, we can actually provision them. Um, you just plug it in, it's gonna pull a, an image. So you can choose Cumulus Linux and it just boots an image and then it's going to grab its config. So this can be completely self-healing. You, you don't have to have a network engineer fly to a DC across the country. You can just have someone plug it in, it's completely automatic. The hitless upgrades, um, something here that's really cool is, is having someone do uh, 
text messaging, alerting. What's cool about all these DevOps tools is they have built-in uh, monitor or uh, messaging apps. Um, so I can actually have this thing message me in Slack, send me an email, send me a text message. Uh, I think there was five other tools. I didn't even know what they were. Um, and they're already built into Ansible and Puppet. Um, automatic threat response. This would just be making IP tables rules. So in Cumulus Linux, we just use IP tables. And Cisco would be ACLs. Um, I'm sure it's similar in Juniper stuff, which I haven't touched as much. Um, let's go into uh, demo time. <laughs> so what I did is we actually have a free product called Cumulus VX, which is a VM of our product that anyone can download here. There's no strings attached. You might get a marketing email at some point. Um, so what we can do is I can actually take this network now, um, and since it's a Linux distribution, I can build up this entire network. So here's a leaf spine network that I kind of alluded to earlier. So instead of using chassis or, or, or large, uh, huge god boxes as we call them, um, we can just split it out into lots of spines. So in this particular example, you can actually, if I lose one spine, I lose one fourth of my throughput, not one half or, or who knows how much, like 100% in some cases. So this is all actually running in Google Compute. Um, through a tool called Ravioli, or Revo Ravello, I think we nicknamed it. Um, I shall show you Ravioli. Is it mirroring? Oh, it's good. So Ravello is just a, um, a tool that our uh, guy who builds our workbench is using. So this is my first time using it. Um, it just spins up VMs and then lets you tie them together. Um, and eventually we're gonna have a way to go from Ravello to Vagrant and Vagrant back to Ravello. So people can take virtual networks and build them up. And if they're building up huge data centers um, to mimic their actual data center, they can now do continuous integration delivery on the virtual network before they make changes to their live network. So Ravello is one tool. Um, we're just a customer of, of theirs. We're just trying it out in our workbench. So basically all these VMs just sit in here and then I can click one. So Workbench VM is just the one I'm running Ansible stuff from. So I just SSH to that particular one. I can even show you, it's not anything fancy. So now I'm going to go into NetDevOps. So all this code's on GitHub, by the way, if anyone's interested. And we'll make sure everything's up. Because I recorded it in case this does not work. <laughs> so everything's up. I just reset it last night. So most people, this used to be amazing if I show them. If I can just, of course, it cross my fingers before I say something like that. So you'll see that I can actually run Ansible on um, all these switches simultaneously. So what's happening here is on, there's 10 switches. So 10 switches are simultaneously being configured. They're from the factory installed. This Ansible playbook is configuring OSPF between them, which is a routing protocol. Someone said using the Quagga routing application. Um, it's configuring the message of the day. It's configuring the uh, IP addressing scheme. I'm actually using something called OSPF unnumbered, um, where we can just burn one IP address per box. So it makes IP address management really, really simple to do. Um, you'll actually see what it actually configured as you see it come in. Now it's restarting the daemon for Quagga. It's restarting uh, the, the networking. It's almost done. It's usually the last step. So what it's actually done here, is it's configured that. So I made my IP addressing super simple for those who aren't used to IP addressing at scale. So just one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And eleven and twelve are Ubuntu hosts, just running twelve oh two. Um, and you'll see this is this is typical for those not familiar with data center design, it's just leaf spine. So if you hear the word CLOS clos or leaf spine, just use those interchangeably. It is not something unique to Cumulus networks, like lots of people are doing this. And even within the chassis systems, a lot of times, 
it's basically a leaf spine. It's just in one proprietary chassis, um, which has, I mean, there's advantages of chassis in certain situations. So what we can do now is, hopefully we'll test ping now. So I can, Now I'm on leaf one. You'll see this is an actual Cumulus VX or virtual VM. Um, it's very similar to our actual product. If I do IP link show, you'll see it comes up with a bunch of ports. A real product would have as many ports as that particular piece of hardware has. So we can run on, we can run on HP and Dell switches. So it would have 48 10 gig ports and four by 40 gig uplinks. Um, this one only uses the ports that I need. So I only needed five because it's a VM. So it just made five plus E0 in the loopback. And now it makes pinging really easy because I don't have to remember the IP addresses. Is now I can ping across. So I'm actually pinging host two because I, I know what I'm doing for a demo. <laughs> and I recorded it in case it doesn't. Um, so what happens when I have a bad fan? So with our tool, we actually have a, I'm sure every, every network vendor out there has ways of reporting like SNMP. So we can, we can do SNMP too. Um, this part I didn't demo out because there's so many ways. I'm not sure what people are gonna prefer. Like I could have a periodic playbook grab JSON files just to check like once an hour. I could have uh, our syslog, remote syslog, and then grip that every minute. I could have, I mean there's a hundred ways to actually grab the errors. I could have an application daemon running on each switch individually and then report it somewhere. Um, I thought about three or four ways, and I was just like, it's not even that important. I'm sure someone will come up with their own system for it. So I'm just gonna assume in this place, because this, this uh, VM doesn't have fans, <laughs> and it doesn't have uh, uh, temperature sensors and stuff like a real switch would, because it's completely virtual, is we're just gonna assume that it broke. So what can I do? What I can do is, um, once I know it, it goes off, is I would kick off an Ansible book, or Ansible playbook. So in this case, I'm just doing it manually, but again, you could just have this auto um, go off. So what this is actually doing is it's gonna go into spine two, and it's going to actually grab the configuration file from the previous playbook, and it's gonna say, hey, this switch had a problem, we're bringing it offline now, gracefully. So what it's actually doing in this particular demo that you guys can download is it's actually increasing the OSPF cost, which makes it not equal load balanced anymore, so now it's taken out of routing. So the next question would be is like, how do we actually check that? How do we make sure that works? So we've actually written module that I'm up, like, it's already upstream to Ansible. It should be part of Ansible core um, soon. Um, hopefully this will work. If this all works, it'll be one of the first demos that everything works on the first try. Um, check. So what this does, is I'm actually going to check the routing from every single device, from every single route I know about, and then see if that route's no longer part of it. Because now I know by checking that route that the 4444 is not being used anymore. So it's basically, if we actually look at that playbook, it's actually under, I don't, how many people have messed with Ansible in the room? I bet it's half, it's more than half. So it's, Ansible is fairly easy, especially for people that know other DevOps tools. Um, check her out. So this playbook, that's it. That's the whole playbook. And you'll actually see, since it just ran here, that I actually just got an email telling me. So I could have an email tell me, I could have a text message tell me, I could have PagerDuty tell me. All these are plugged into Ansible, Puppet, and Chef. They all have these kind of tools. There's tons of startups and established companies building these kind of reporting tools. So now I could be at home with my wife eating dinner and I get a report and it goes, hey, this went down, and I give it a minute, and then it sends me another email that goes, hey, we took care of it for you. <laughs> and that, that's exactly what I think SDN should be in a lot of cases. SDN shouldn't be just like pigeonholed into one particular um, moment. So in this case, We'll kind of visualize that now for people that aren't as networking savvy, is we remove this. So we have uh, four ways. It's called ECMP four-way, because I have four spine switches. 
Um, we actually have customers, like three or four now, doing 16-way ECMP. These are for like large data centers. So when they lose one spine switch, it goes offline, power failure or something, they only lose 1 16th of their data center bandwidth. Um, it's a huge amount of bandwidth. It's not for every customer. This is, I mean, obviously you would have, for, with four leaves, I could actually support like 32 leaves. So like 32 racks easily um, with no problem whatsoever. Um, with probably this would be three to, yeah, it would be three to one, three to one over subscription for really cheap. None of these switches are more than 10 grand. They're all less. Um, so what we did is I, I, 444 is the one I want to take offline. So Playbook, all it did, and all the code's available, it's fairly simple. After confirmation, Spine 2 has a bad fan. We use something like Esmon CTL, which just pulls, it can do JSON or, or human readable text. Uh, using a command CLOSPF interface set swap to the max, that's the max value that OSPF has according to the RFC. And then I wanna check it. Because something I don't think DevOps tools are actually used for is they can actually check state, especially with these, these push-based ones. And all of the major tools have push-based ways to check. In this case, um, CL prefix check, it's just, it's literally going in there, it's doing IP route on that specific route, and then it checks to see if that device is no longer there. Because it's not enough just to make the change. You want to check state to make sure that's no longer being used. If I actually wanted to take this further, what I would probably do is also run another playbook with a timeout looking at the counters to make sure data was off that switch. It just depends on, on how, how detailed you want to go down that rabbit hole um, to make it kind of graceful. So you're gracefully taking it out. So when you unplug it, you know you're not bringing down any sessions to your servers. And then alerting, I think, is huge. I think a lot of SNMP applications are completely manual. Um, the alerting, like I did, I added the alerting Friday night in an hour, and I had not done the email alert on, on a Ansible before. Never touched it. I was using a phone thing, but I switched phone plans. I usually have it text me, but it stops working because I switched from Verizon to T-Mobile, and it stops working, so I just picked another app. Um, but I think, I, I think there was like five or 10 in there. So basically, it's just gotten rid of this device. So I'm actually still getting a fairly good over subscription ratio. And then because provisioning is normal DevOps, I can just plug in another switch and it's back online and probably, I mean, you saw it provision the first time. It'd probably take about three minutes and then it's completely configured again. Because then your DevOps tool becomes your configuration management at that point. Let's see what else. And then you see I had the email. Email I'll let you know. So it's on my GitHub. It's Sean X820, um, Net DevOps is what I called it. I don't know, there's probably a better name for this kind of stuff. But I'm gonna try to get all these examples on our website. So it's really cool is that you guys can do this too. So with Cumulus um, BX, which is something I fought really hard for to get out, um, this makes this kind of a no-brainer for a lot of IT organizations. So if your guys' IT organization doesn't have money to look at this yet, you it's, this is free, so you can go download this today and kind of play with it. Um, so I, I hinted at CI and, and CD um, that might be unfamiliar to network engineers, but this idea of continually testing what the changes you are making to, to your gear. And this is kind of a no-brainer for people that do DevOps, but it's, it's not so clear to people who manage routing protocols or manage spanning tree or VXLAN. Like, it's just a different kind of market, and they have a skill set that is important. Um, my background was a lot of that, but it just makes sense to actually automate everything, um, automate all of things. <laughs> um, so that's free. I think, I think again, I said it's just, I, it might make you register. If you have Vagrant, it'll just download it regardless. Um, so Vagrant, GNS3, KVM, VirtualBox, VMware, whatever your favorite virtualization is, it's going to look just like um, Debian Linux, we're a Debian Linux based distro. Um, but again, some of these some of these tools, like they're part of Ansible, so if, if you're never looking at Cumulus, like you can run the same idea on, on a Cisco box, depending. I just don't know which ones support what Ansible. Um, it's, it's part of the reason I came to, to work at a Linux company. Um, so what is open source? So, so Quagga is open source. Anyone have any questions, I can do handouts for the last two turtles. Or I can quiz people. Yeah. 
Yeah. So with these kind of topologies, what's really cool is Cisco won't, hopefully not, there's not Cisco people in here, but some of them will agree. Um, yeah, so, so this topology, Cisco could sell you today. And the reason they won't is because they make less money doing it. Um, actually, like, um, I worked as a consultant, so I didn't really care about the sales, but like, if I'm gonna sell a giant $1 million chassis, or I'm gonna sell a one RU switch, um, which one am I gonna get commission off that's better, right? So it's actually something, I do a lot of the sales partner training, and I, like, it's not even worth training a partner who can sell Cisco, because he's gonna sell Cisco just to make more money. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they'll, that's what, Yeah, so these, you can, give, you can give that guy a turtle. <laughs> <laughs> so, so even, so one, actually I can, that's nice as I have all the, I have all the slides. Yeah, we're, we have to explain that we're not a plushy selling. People ask me, what do you guys do? And I'm like, we sell plushy and plushy accessories. <laughs> um, so, one, I'll step back. We, we run on Facebook six pack. Um, we can run. They don't, I don't think they have that in production. That's a chassis that Facebook did. It's a bare metal chassis. Or chassis. Um, if you ever Google about it, you can find Cumulus Linux running on it. Two, no one's asked us for that. If someone said, I wanna buy 10 of those, we'd probably make it work and sell you 10 of those. And why? Why is the answer for that? So I don't know. I think there's gonna be, at some point, there'll be a Linux chassis or something, um, but this is this is kind of what we think is like when you look at a chassis, it's it's two supervisor modules, six lines, 288 hosts. It has fate sharing, power power failure, supervisor failure, fabric failure. So as like a Cisco sales guy or consultant in the field, I had to memorize what's the failure time if I pull this supervisor for the next one to go on. And it's different every single year for every single type of supervisor. There's 10 supervisors that work for this chassis. Like it's almost like a, um, like this modular proprietary vendor lock-in game of what works on what to, and what power module works on this. The newest Cisco stuff actually has like a, um, a, a special blade just to control the power on it. Um, so, not that I don't think, I think there's certain cases where chassis make sense in dense campus environments for like a closet or something where you're getting a lot of ports there. So what I think's happened in data centers, and this is what Google's doing, this is what Facebook's doing, is the chassis became unimportant because these commodity switches are all line rate. So if I have a 32 by 40 gig uh, switch, it's literally 1,280 gig backplane. Like, I'm not gonna lose any traffic. It can actually do 104 ports breakout. That's 60, it's non, if I was doing non-blocking, like, as much bandwidth going up, um, should be 16 times um, 40. So 640 gigs for about $8,000 non-blocking, 64 hosts. So when you look at a chassis like this, I think the reason um, um, we haven't done a chassis yet, we actually worked on it at one point, is that no one wants it because all these modern data center networks are moving towards this fine leaf. Because when you don't, you're not tied into vendor uh, optics or cables or anything, it just breaks it out and it, it makes a lot of sense. So there's, there's a lot of, hmm? yeah, and it can grow horizontally. Slide. There's another slide I have. So you can just keep adding layers like that. So the next question is, Cisco can do that too, right? Why aren't they doing it? Because it, because they get commission based on the, on the. I mean, I wouldn't if I was a Cisco sales guy. And there, and there are advantages to chassis in certain points of view. So I don't want to knock them under. And I'm not going to say maybe someday there's a Cumulus Linux chassis 
but it's a good question to, to understand. So capacity, like if someone says capacity, like that was like that first slide I showed, is it's not, it's all, it's literally the same hardware um, for, for, for these type of market. Now we don't, we're not in all the markets Cisco is or Juniper is. Juniper has really nice edge devices um, that we can't compete with. We don't have a product in that space. Cisco has edge devices like where you would peer with service providers that we just don't make sense as like what we call a customer edge or provider edge. We don't make sense in that environment yet. Someday we'd like to get there, I'm sure. And it might take commodity hardware to reach that level because we're not a hardware company, we're an OS company. But for top of rack, spine switches, distribution switches, campus switches, PoE switches, a lot of people are paying a lot of money. Um, so this is just an alternative. Now if you still love Cisco, Cisco, you can put, you can do a spine leaf with Cisco, why not? Um, I don't know, I haven't seen it. Yeah, 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 exactly. That's when you would get a consulting engagement from Mr. Heller here in the green shirt. No, but there's there's different, um, there's nothing really unique from our product standpoint. Um, for disaster recovery and things, it's usually what they'll do is something um, uh, gratuitous art for VM migration. So we run in data centers, it's really up to the data center admin how he wants to do it. So I guess the only interesting thing that we might do that I haven't seen deployed yet is we can do VXLAN, um, which is a tunnel mechanism. Um, at L2, so just like GRE tunnels are a very simple L3 tunnel, VXLAN's a very simple L2 tunnel, and that's where all these network virtualizations are built around, but if I just do a static tunnel between you and me, I can send VLAN traffic. And at that point, it makes a lot of sense for multi-tenant data center, or not, data centers that are geographically dispersed, you could actually probably tunnel L2 traffic across. Now, has it been tested? I, I have no idea. I know some people have done it. I don't know what scale they've done it at. Um, but at that point, I would, you could probably just route it across. Um, usually that's within the hypervisor or the, or the management software. So like um, OpenStack with KVM uses gratuitous art, so it announces the new VM location as it brings it down. Um, uh, VMware does gratuitous art. Uh, Microsoft Hyper-V, I think. They, it's, what's funny is it's all, developers running that, and they use different terms. They won't say gratuitous ARP, it'll be like ARP announce, or they'll use a different word. So it's like talking the right language to the right person. And the documentation for all of them is very weird about the networking. Like OpenStack's very, uh, they recreate VRFs with IP NAT islands from a network engineering perspective. Like it's very weird. Um, I almost need like a whole other talk just on OpenStack and, and network stuff, because there's a lot of stuff in the network space that Cisco solved 10 years ago that OpenStack's kind of reinventing, in my opinion, um, that's very interesting. Um, so we have an ML2 plugin coming out like this quarter or next, end of this quarter. Um, but I don't, I don't know how much value actual ML2 plugins give in, which might be another talk, because I, I just don't see it being that, that cool, in my opinion. Um, so, any other, yeah? Well, the testing talks about JIT and what JIT is. Yeah. Do guys do any testing along those lines, or so customers that are interested? What's nice is, uh, you, do you work for Red Hat? I do work for Red yeah, Hat. Yeah, so Red Hat, Red, Red, Red Hat cleared the way for us. Yeah. Um, so Red Hat's actually JITIC certified. So that means they had to certify each of the applications, like SSHD. So they've already done the work for us. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, JITICs, they tie hardware to software, so I imagine you guys had to like test a Dell server with Red Hat, then yeah, test it, yeah. So that's what we're gonna have to go through, okay. just being a startup. Yeah, just curious, because that's interesting. Yeah, no, there's been a lot of interest. Um, we're, we don't have a DC-based account manager yet, so it's just me and Ashley, like, <laughs> that's your, That's the whole sales team for 10 states there. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's something, yeah. So they're doing, uh, um, we have some military customers, but I don't think anything will get anywhere until yeah, JIDIC, so JIDIC happens. So JIDIC, for those who don't know, is just, it's just like a suite of tests, like interoperability tests. Like it's obviously super important to the government to do uh, VRP, like high, like uh, 
uh, uh, virtual router redundancy protocol, but I need to have it work between a brocade and a Cisco because they don't want to be tied to a single vendor. So this disaggregation stuff is going to look really attractive to, uh, to military. We just have to get our ducks in a row. And unfortunately, a lot of whoever's first to the market, like Harris Radio, Cisco Switches, they always make the test that you have to pass to sell. So you like basically have to recreate their product to, to sell against it. So it'll be, it'll be interesting. But uh, yeah, I had, I did. what's the next? It's not just Gossler talking, is it? So we can do, yeah, I should pull up. Yeah. One sec, I have a good slide for this. Yeah. So I didn't want to make too much of a product pitch for the, but uh, for our for our product, I mean, there's a free product, so that makes it nice. So everything everything's open source on the box. So spanning tree is MSTBD. Um, you can grab that and put it on Ubuntu. Quagga's uh, open source. It does BGP, OSPF that we support. You can also do ISIS, but we don't support it yet because we just haven't worked on the code. Um, there's uh, IF up down two. It just went into Debian main. I saw. So we actually rewrote the Etsy network interfaces configuration file. So doing things like bringing up ports 1 through 10 without touching ports 11 through 20, that was something that Ubuntu couldn't do. So we had to like rewrite it to be more, um, what's the word, I'm potent. Uh, yeah. It's been redone. So we do VLANs, a VLAN's a VLAN. We do bonds, which is the Linux term for ether channels, which Cisco uses. Spanning tree we have, um, it's, it's a spanning tree daemon. Um, um, that's the MSTPD. And then we do LLDP by default. It's backwards compatible with Cisco. Um, it's a free open source thing too. You could put that on Ubuntu if you want. Prescriptive topology manager, that's something we made, but we open sourced it. PTM just checks LLDP state against um, a, a net map basically to check your links. So in case you just run this as a as a cron job to check what's going on. But we do, we have high availability MLAG and virtual router redundancy. And then if VRR is the active active solution for L2 redundancy, um, but we also have a VRRPD daemon that can interop with like Cisco or Brocade or whatever. Now I haven't tested them all, but it's just an open source app. And then, again, I already mentioned this one. We do OSPF and BGP. I think the most interesting thing is BGP in the data center without an IGP, which we're starting to see from a lot of customers. But it's in the pipeline, I'll say that. We have a customer on beta code, but we, I can't promise a timeline yet. So MPLS is there. All right, I ran out of time, so let's. <laughs>